Well, welcome. I'm Dennis McQuiston. This is part two of a two-part series on the world's most important resource, water. Now, in part one, we talked about Texas and the United States. And on this part, we're going to show you what's happening around the world. Now, here's the good news. About 71% of the earth is covered in water. The bad news, about 97% of that is salt water in the oceans. And about 3%, 2% or so is ice. That leaves 1% or so that we can drink and we can grow food with and obviously deal with hygiene. So what are the situations that we should be looking at? What caused the problem? And more importantly, what are the solutions? We're gonna talk about those things and maybe even what you can do about it. Now, my co-host on this program is Lisa Hembry again. Lisa was Dallas County treasurer at one time. She has a great background in media and literacy, but most important for this program, she's on the board of the Trinity River Authority. But before I bring Lisa in, let me ask you to watch a brief clip from the International Water Resources Association. And that clip has on it Gabriel Eckstein, someone that I interviewed and you'll see and hear from him during the program. Globally, we have a uh, very serious uh, situation ongoing uh, with growing populations, uh, expanding economies, and of course, climate change. And this is putting a, a significant stress on our water resources, be they surface water, groundwaters, lakes, rivers, aquifers, and so on. And we need to have a better sense of how we uh, manage our resources sustainably so that we have adequate water for our populations, for our environment today, but also uh, into the future. 50 years ago, the International Water Resources Association was organized by a group of uh, individuals who felt that there was a, a great need to bring people together to talk about these management e issues, the scarcity issues, and, and the need for a better understanding of how water fits into our society, into our environment. And so this organization was created as a platform to bring experts, to bring policymakers, to bring everyday people together so that they can talk about these critical issues and be able to share experiences and share new technologies, new ideas, new management uh, techniques. We are very concerned with access to water, with clean water, safe water for, for people, for populations, also for the environment. Lisa? Why don't you introduce the guests and get us started? Also on this program is Isis Mejias, who earned her doctorate in environmental engineering. She's the founder and director of WASH, Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene, through Rotary International. Rosario Sanchez is leader of the Transboundary Aquifer Assessment Program at the Texas Water Resources Institute, and she is founder and director of the Permanent Forum of Binational Waters. Welcome, ladies. Rosario, let's begin with you. What are your thoughts on this issue? Well, I totally agree, of course, uh, with, with Gabriel and the need to be more sensitive in terms of what water means and our role with water and our environment. We usually think as water as a separate resource that feeds our systems, economic, social, everything needs water. All, all our human uh, relationships with nature, with the industry, with the society, with the economic development, it's linked to water. But we don't conceive that relationship yet. We see it as a resource that must to be must be consumed. Now, if you look at water uh, and you look at poverty, they are completely and uh, related. Uh, the more poverty we have in the world, the more the separation between rich and poor, the more the distances uh, between water justice as well and water access to those communities. At international level, for example, water resources that are nationally uh, located are, are, are running out uh, at a national level and more people and more uh, resources now are being located at transboundary basins, which is shared. So what we have left in the world in terms of water 
is shared now, half of it. So more challenges to come in, in, in not just in terms of environment, but also in the political systems and the way we relate to, to, to each other as countries. We will come back to that in just a minute. Isis, what are your thoughts about that? Sure, thank you, Lisa. And I'd like to talk about the term WASH, which as you mentioned, stands for water, sanitation, and hygiene. This term was coined by the Sanitation and Hygiene Fund in the early 2000s. And it was really to refer to a term that um, shows that water plays a much bigger role in our lives than the glass of water we drink every day. Having access to WASH is not only about clean water, involves having access to a toilet with proper drainage and a sewage system that takes the wastewater to a, a septic tank or a wastewater treatment plant um, and solid waste collection. And the third one is the hygiene portion, which involves having hand washing facilities at home with soap and being having the ability to clean our utensils, the food we eat, and the spaces where we live to prevent pathogen transmission. And this is important because the three components must be present for us to have health. About every 60 seconds, um, a person dies from something most of us don't consider a threat. But in, in many countries around the world, um, about 2 billion people don't have access to water. And I think the statistic that is more shocking is that about 2 billion don't have access to sanitation. I call WASH the holy trinity of health um, because we need the three components. But most importantly, we need to work together. Private industry, nonprofit organizations like Rotary International, where I've, I've been, I have experience with uh, other organizations, um, governments, utility companies, because no single entity can solve this problem alone. And we need to get to work together with communities to design interventions where people not only get access to clean water, but are also educated into how to maintain and operate these systems. Rosario, what are the primary issues that um, we're dealing with along the U.S.-Mexico boundary? Uh, you've been dealing with these issues for over 20 years. What are the primary issues that we're faced with right now? The bigger issues in terms of water, it's one is the quality of the water, the, the difference in the institutional systems between the two countries. Mexico has a centralized system. The US, each state, it's its own country, basically. So we're dealing with five different countries, not just two countries. It's five different countries when you look at it that way. So Mexico has to deal with each one and, and the U.S. has to deal with Mexico, depending on the state that you're talking about. So we have two big international reservoirs, or international basins, the Rio Colorado, the Rio Grande. And what we're seeing right now is basically the effects of, of climate change, which we are calling now the aridification. We are changing the landscape. We are, we are witnessing the changing on the life landscape on the border much less surface water available. The Rio Grande has just reported uh, dry stretches of the river as we speak. Uh, and you all have seen the levels of the Rio Colorado on, on, on the other side. The Hoover Dam levels are record in history. Since, the, since 1994, when we signed the treaty between Mexico and the US, this year was the lowest record of water allocated to the U.S. on history. So what does that mean? It means that we are facing really uh, today serious surface water shortages. And on the other side of the, of the coin is groundwater, which we don't have a framework to regulate it. We don't have a treaty to regulate groundwater. So the new water sources that potentially can complement or conjunctively used with surface water are not regulated. So that, that's a big pressure and it's, a, it's a really a concern for, for national security, for binational security, call it that way. 
So those for me are the biggest challenges that we're facing. And of course, uh, because this is pressing, I mean, the permanent drought now, we don't have any extraordinary drought. We have permanent drought conditions now. Uh, Mexico is, is very, very behind on the way of, of designing preparedness plans and coping with, with water scarcity in the border region. And the border region, uh, in terms of population, is just going to duplicate in the next 30, 40 years. So where is the water going to come from? Where is the water going to come from? Well, most of it is going to come from groundwater. Uh, so it's risky there because we don't know much about groundwater in the region. And we don't have a okay. regulation uh, for that. The rest is not going to come from surface water. I mean, our both uh, international basins are, are exhausted. Uh, it needs to come from incentives. It needs to come. It needs to come from conservation for more, much more water reuse, much more water treatment, and and of course changing this strategy and the development strategy in the border region. Agriculture intensive and extensive use of of, of water uh, programs are just unsustainable. They are just unsustainable anymore, and it's the major water user in the border. So it needs to come from, somebody needs to lose. Transporting water from point A to point B and determining who owns that water and uh, where that water is coming from and where it's going are serious problems. And I know those are some of the things that you deal with. Isis, let's talk about the WASH program again. What are the primary successes and what are the challenges that your organization faces dealing with uh, sanitation and hygiene issues in underserved communities. Sure, Lisa. I think the the main issue is that we're used to thinking of the world water crisis um, only about water scarcity, uh, about water quantity. When in reality, in many countries in the world, the root cause of the water scarcity is the, the quality of those limited resources that they have. Um, so sometimes we forget that most of the water we have in the planet is salt water. Out of all that water in the world, 3% is fresh water. Um, and from that fresh water, about 69 is frozen in glaciers and 30% it's underneath the earth as groundwater and only Less than 1%, 0.3 is readily available for human consumption. And I think it touches on the, the point that Rosario was making that we need to reuse uh, more water and, and have more efforts in the, in the treatment aspect. Um, but this is a tiny proportion, the, the 0.3, that is threatened the most by contaminants, uh, like microorganisms, for example. So Poor water quality of those limited resources affects the quantity because we cannot reuse the water. It costs more to treat them uh, for agriculture, bathing, um, or drinking. In the humanitarian sectors, the majority of the, of the organizations often um, only address the water quantity aspect and not the water quality. And so when we don't address these waste streams, when we don't address the solid waste in communities, pathogens continue to thrive in the environment and they reach the drinking water sources. So access to wash can interrupt the pathogen replication cycle. Sanitation is a primary barrier because it, it collects the fecal matter in a toilet and it sends it um, to a, a treatment and it prevents from that pathogen reaching the environment. The secondary mm -hmm. barrier, such as water treatment, um, it prevents the, the, the pathogens from reaching the fluids and the foods that we eat. And the tertiary barriers, such as hand washing and cleaning of households, prevents the pathogens from reaching new hosts. So I think we should be looking more at the sanitation and, and hygiene aspect, and it, it's not um, currently happening. We need to address more those two aspects and the water management aspects so that the treatment technologies that are implemented in communities around the world are aligned with the user's ability to pay. 
Well, thanks, Isis. And when I interviewed Gabriel Eckstein a few days ago, I asked him for his take on what the situation is in the world. Here's what he had to say. I would describe the present state of the world's water situation as a bit of a, uh, a mixed situation. Um, we have uh, almost a, a billion people without access to fresh drinking water to even have a glass of water available to them. And we have more than 2 billion people who do not have access to adequate water uh, for sanitation purposes. Uh, and at the same time, you look at the oceans, you look at the lakes and rivers around the world, uh, there's lots of water out there that could provide uh, that needed water, except that it's not always in the right place. You've got Canada and Russia and Brazil and other countries with lots and lots of water, but at the same time, you've got the Middle East, you've got the American Southwest, you've got Central Asia, Northern China, uh, that are lacking, uh, lacking water resources. And so the distribution is a significant, significant problem. The other problem that I see that uh, in terms of the world's water situation is uh, capacity, knowledge uh, in terms of how to manage the resources, how to produce clean water, treat it, and how to deliver it to where it's needed. We need to think about what we eat <laughs> to start with. And because that, you know, how much water does it take uh, for me to eat a salad or a piece of uh, steak today? Uh, where is it coming from? What, what type of, uh, what quality of water was that irrigated with? Uh, those questions, those raise awareness. I think that we have underestimated a little bit the power of awareness in the public and the communities. Sometimes we don't tell people much about, you know, how the, the hard work that takes to take water to your, to your table, right? To your restroom, to your kitchen. Here in the U.S., for example, you just open the tap water and you see water and you hardly yeah. question where is it coming from and how much did it took the city or the utility to get that water to you? Where is the water coming? Is it coming from groundwater? Has it been treated before? How much is it costing and how much are you actually paying for that? Well, thanks, Rosario. You know, I had the occasion to ask Gabriel Eckstein about what he thought the causes of the problem were. Here's what he said. So some of the causes that we're seeing worldwide in terms of, of uh, uh, water issues, uh, we have scarcity, we have uh, depletion and so on. And I think part of it is what I mentioned earlier in terms of the, the poor distribution and lack of capacity of, of uh, communities and people around the world in terms of being able to meet their water needs. But I think uh, part of it is also uh, that nations have a very individualistic and, and rather self-centered perspective on how to manage water resources. Um, they are looking at their own particular national interests as opposed to the global needs and, and, and uh, global priorities of meeting everyone's uh, water priorities. Yes, but Gabriel, isn't it normal for people to act in their self-interest? It is natural. I mean, we are nation states. We do think of our countries first and foremost. Uh, but at the same time, we have to realize that uh, these are human beings living around the world and they are in need. Uh, and they are, you know, areas where potential lack of water resources can spur conflict. And one of the things we are seeing today even with the situation in Ukraine uh, and other places in the, uh, in the Gulf area um, and other parts of the world, water is a serious issue that is part of the potential for conflict. Uh, water has been always said to be a source of cooperation, but there's always the potential for conflict where you just don't have enough water to go around. We're, we're running out of time, but I did want to get to Isis for any final thoughts about what we as individuals can do for our own self-interest, briefly. Yeah, um, so I, I, I wanted to agree also with Rosario because um, awareness is so important um, right now to, to, to do something about the world water crisis. Water is so important that once it becomes available, it has a ripple effect in all aspects of society. And we have an opportunity to do something about it. Um, people can volunteer as well in 
of the many organizations that are working um, either in international uh, development projects or locally. I mean, if you're a writer, you can help writing stories about how water changes somebody's life. If you work in the corporate world, you can help create relationships with corporate donors. If you're a teacher, you can also help create content for education programs in primary schools. If you're a doctor uh, in the area of infectious diseases, you can help identifying uh, relevant health data for wash interventions. Clean water has the power to reduce suffering more than any other human endeavor, and there's something to do for everyone. So with so many people suffering, isn't it great that we can do something about it? I think the main message is to educate yourself, to read more about what you can do every day to reduce your water footprint and to help others get more clean water. Thanks, Isis. I had the opportunity to ask Gabriel Eckstein about what he thought the solutions were to the problem. Let's watch. To meet our challenges today and into the future, I do think we need to invest in water. And what I mean by that is invest in the infrastructure, invest in knowledge development, invest in capacity development, uh, and invest in other countries. I don't think people re realize that uh, that in investing in water has a huge return on that investment. And I, and I mean in the economic terms too. Uh, there have been studies that suggest that it's a nine to one ratio, meaning for every dollar invested in water quality, uh, water quantity, allocation, distribution, treatment, so on, you get $9 or up to $9 in economic return. And this is something that I don't think that people re uh, understand fully in terms of the value that this can generate uh, uh, to not just to us here locally, but to the world community as a whole. Um, in addition, I do think that we have to recognize that uh, as smart as we are, uh, nature might be a little smarter than us. And we need to invest in what we call nature-based solutions. Uh, nature knows how to, to uh, reclaim contaminated water. Nature knows how to protect our, our communities on the shore. It knows how to minimize and mitigate against flooding. And if we learn how to not necessarily mimic, mimic but work with nature uh, and enhance nature's ability to manage these uh, water resources, it will, uh, I think, go a, a much further way than we've ever been able to do it with our own you know, technological mechanisms that we've invented uh, and applied on top of nature. Uh, I, I think working with nature is going to produce a much uh, better outcome uh, for us locally and globally. Now, Rosario, how do you see the solutions? In my case, I will put a meter on your shower, no more than five minutes of showering. Every time that it rains, capture that water somehow in your garden. If you have a garden, just capture it and reuse it. With those two things, and of course, fix your leaks. That's 30% of, of wastewater, of, of the waste that we have on water. So fix the leaks, three things, and it will change. You know, just before we close, I'd like to play a clip with Eckstein again when I ask him to explain the situation in Israel and Jordan and the possible very interesting solution to their water issues. The lack of water is, is huge. Just for comparison purposes, the amount of water that is available on a per capita basis in the, in the United States is thousand, literally thousands times more than what a typical Jordanian or Palestinian or Israeli has. So uh, they have learned to become very water efficient. Now, doesn't mean that they've solved their water problems. They've just have become more efficient and they've learned to diversify. Um, you know, getting water from the river, getting water from groundwater, getting water from desalination. I will say one of the most innovative and exciting uh, new situations uh, that is seems to be uh, emerging right now is that uh, Jordan has a lot of open, sunny spaces. Um, and Israel also has some open, sunny spaces, but they have access to the Mediterranean Sea. Well, when you combine energy and desalination technology, I think you, you've got a really neat opportunity to produce water using solar energy in Jordan, 
and then be and you know basically transfer that water to Jordan uh, in in exchange for that energy. And this this water energy exchange is now being uh, uh, um, explored uh, with some pilot projects, and they're trying also to get the Palestinians involved. Uh, but this is something that is is just starting to develop. There's a number of uh, non-governmental and governmental organizations that are very involved in this, and this is something that uh, you know I'm I'm fairly optimistic about. Hey, that's it, Lisa. Thank you, and thank you, Isis and Rosario, and of course to Gabriel Eckstein for that interview that we took a few pieces from. We hope you'll join us on TV.com for part one of this series, and we hope you'll also join us on social media to find out what we're doing all the time. Now, when you use water, when you take that drink, when you take that one Saturday night bath a week, be careful how much water you're using. Always continue to join us right here as we bring you unique perspectives on things that matter with people who care.